Hello everyone, today we talk about Polish heavy infantry of the 13th century. And you know, every day I choose randomly these topics, and when I come to these fighters' prototypes, I always stop and say, you know, this sounds very wargamistic. Like, what is heavy infantry in the 13th century, for example, compared to, I don't know, cavalry, right? Aren't we really talking about the same guys here? In part, yes. Um, this is elite, right? And what we want to talk about in general is more like how we can frame this prototypes diachronically, why uh, we can in fact go by a approximation to define these models and saying okay from this we can understand more broadly even things about I mean even cavalry even about light infantry and more in general the warfare of the specific times and places. So this is a challenge of course because the risk is in fact approximating or generalizing or categorizing um, in a way that would make people believe that this is kind of it, it was like that that all the Polish heavy infantrymen were like this etc. Um, and also that Poland had kind of a you know completely different uh, character from, from other countries could be distinguished. No, we, when we talk about the 13th century, uh, but even pre-industrial times in general, um, we always have to think that there is a largely homogeneous base, right? You know, there are differences that help us to understand, of course, a lot about uh, local warfare and give uh, that may also make a lot of sense, especially when you start making comparison and you you actually by you know substantiating of course uh, the evidence you're talking about um, and but but not thinking that since you know this is a type then it has to be for for all the others and I, I like to d say this at the beginning uh, of such videos and I did it already uh, sometime because I realized that. Um, it's easy to criticize at that point a content that apparently presents itself at least uh, just like into a a package right uh, that says ah you know here we we get scientifically about all about the 13th century Polish heavy infantrymen well no we we will try to see essentially what we're talking about it's also very uh, interesting that you know I we, I, I discussed so many times Polish warfare recently, which is completely random, and today even, um, you know, we have this. Tomorrow we have another video that is actually about not just Poland, but also other uh, Slavic and also Bal you know, sort of Balkanic or Eastern um, powers together that uh, have a bit more of a political and military um, uh, themed uh, aim at least, but we'll talk also about warfare of, of such quite extended regions that at, at a certain point it's even too, you know, excessive to, to generalize upon. Um, and so if you're interested, I think I, I'm, I'm going to create a Polish warfare playlist uh, where you can find already the substantial amount of stuff that I've already made about Polish warfare, just letting you know that we will expand it to every uh, country of the Middle Ages within the range of from, you know, from, from Ireland to India, right? So that's that's the goal of Schwerpunkt at this point. So, and I say this because we already made especially one video about the same period, that is Polish cavalry tactics between the 11th and the 13th century, that actually covers um, pretty well, I think, um, the the general picture uh, already and already gets to some conclusions. And I know actually that you're interested in these topics because every time I make a Polish warfare video, I, I get a lot of views. So um, I'm, I'm glad about it. Of course, um, everything can be per you know done better. Of course, and uh, but I'm, I'm glad at least that you 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 find these topics somewhat uh, interest. Um, and so when we talk about Poland this time, we're talking about a very specific case of a central uh, U European power that uh, had actually mm, was undergoing certain transitions you can find, in fact, as we will see better tomorrow, in other areas of the Slavic world. And um, that was essentially this initial capacity of encompassing a certain area like the, the one of the Polish kingdom and objectively it was not small geographically but that and it was you know powerful in, in this regard but that 
you know, after this m moment of um, emergence, let's say, um, got fragmented over time at the point that we can't even talk about the continuity of a true monarchy, right? And uh, considering is that Poland uh, eventually, especially in the 13th century, like a cluster of different uh, duchies, uh, theoretically, m you know, kept together by the the Piast dynasty um, uh, legacy and the, uh, of course, the opportunities, the same monarchical uh, institution, of course, presented for, for the nobility of Poland, um, but through which we can see, in fact, uh, and today we will discuss, in fact, this last part more, more than else, the development of certain models that resemble or are actually overlapping w with um, Western feudalism. You know that the, the, the Western feudalism comes from this area of northern France, broadly expands uh, over time. Um, from from there emanates. So, uh, in this mm, travel towards the east, first it kind of uh, invests Germany, that especially towards the second half of the 12th century starts developing kind of feudal structures on the Western Frankish model uh, and reinforcing them. And from there, there is of course the the German expansion towards the east that brings to this mm, colonization and um, expansion into mm, largely uh, Slavic or uh, however Baltic territories uh, and that mm, Germanizes, in this sense Frankicizes, if we can say like this, mm, important areas of the Slavic world as well. Think about Bohemia that basically gets even incorporated in, institutionally speaking into the Holy Roman Empire and becomes heavily Germanized to the point it's even difficult to, in terms of warfare, to distinguish certain things. Normally, I'm kind of, um, um, I know that I have, I have Czech audience, and it's kind of said that it, in these books that, that I have, it, Bohemia is never kind of typicized for this reason. It's, it's al always put together with, with the lands of the empire, and, and rightfully, I think, but it's part of the, the, the point I was making at the beginning that is essentially that of course the differences here are uh, of course exist and are important but at the same time there is a, a, a much sounder base that you have to take into account at the point that and, and you can't even distinguish properly and of course Poland has this um, sees this phenomenon as well of course and especially in the northwestern areas uh, even the Polish kingdom has kind of a definition and expansion that um, that evolves over time, territorially speaking. Um, uh, Great Poland and Poznan and Little Poland, for example, around um, Krakow to the southwest were united at the end of the 10th century. Mazovia, northeast of Warsaw, Silesia uh, to the um, northwest and Lausitz in what is now eastern Germany were all drawn into the Polish state in the early 11th century, right? Um, Pomerania on the Baltic coast was also occupied for a while before falling under German domination as briefly uh, where what are now Czech Republic and Slovakia plus parts of the Ukraine further east, right? And therefore by the year 1100 Poland basically occupied m m much of the same territory as it does today, right? With, with the exception of that eventually would change historically to eventually revert, of course, in the 20th century. And the one we know today, um, and here uh, in the 12th century, with the exception of Pomerania on the Baltic coast and the southern Prussian lands, mm -hmm. were occupied by other peoples and eventually occupied by <laughs> by the Germans, um, and um, and these frontiers remain relatively unchanged over this time, even in the 13th century. Um, of course, Lausitz and Silesia were lost to, to Germany in the 13th century. Uh, such losses would be partially compensated by eastern gains, for example, in the 40s of the 14th century, Ruthenian and uh, Ruthenia and Galicia would be reacquired, where would be actually acquired from the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, with which there will be also the, the Union later on, and uh, which had itself, by the way, Lithuania only recently taken them from a fragmented and weakened Russia after the disgregation of the Kievan Rus with the Mongol invasions. So actually, um, Poland, Poland in this period is a very fascinating uh, land to look at because it, it was actually pretty diverse um, and it resented, as we will see today, several influences from, from different countries. 
and um, what it seems uh, here, uh, it, it's a different even to give a picture. We, we don't know exactly a lot about, you know, the, the strictly the, the details, the minutiae of, of warfare, right? But we can uh, draw this kind of stereotypical picture for which uh, Northwestern Slavs um, appeared to have had originally a few cavalry, right? The Slavs in general, the, uh, since the migration era, hadn't were characterized by infantry, but during the high medieval period, of course, with the contacts of the peoples of the steppes, um, they actually acquired a lot um, of it. And actually, um, the uh, the Poles, as such, might have had rather more cavalry than other Slavic tribes, such as the Vans, the Vilses, or the Obertrides, for example. And and they also were seemingly moderately well armed. We know that it was actually a, a, a high proportion of cavalry in Polish armies, which is uh, important to uh, to stress, um, as it makes you realize that Poland, as many regions of Central Eastern Europe, actually is uh, probably there's not even makes much sense to make this distinction because these areas were relatively open to and kind of even politically f fluid this time. So that there were uh, waves of, um, you know, even from the steppes, thinking about, you know, Poland was invaded three times. I mean, not just once, during by the Mongols in the 13th century. Um, so uh, these impacts were, were actually strong. And of course, this, the, now we consider this, this country you know, kind of the heartland of Europe. But I think that at that time, of course, th this was open to to a lot of movements that were pressuring, even helping, of course, to centralize, but also to to confer certain particular character to to these armed forces. And and at this time, Polish cavalry was actually well developed. I mean, it wasn't developed according to the Frankish model yet. I mean, in the 13th century, actually, yes, um, but in, in the 11th and the 12th, it, it, it was kind of on the average kind of Slavic um, uh, fascist, we can say, um, characterized essentially by a, a lot of, num numerically speaking, a lot of cavalry. One third is a lot, but also relatively less framed into kind of a feudal system that can give it kind of a, an order in a kind of a consistent and however narrower elite, right? So the, this, the, the, the stereotype is fundamentally that uh, this Polish cavalry was originally lighter than the, um, than the Frankish one, the Western one, let's say. Uh, and then progressively, and especially in the 13th century, it undergoes a you know, progressive, in fact, Frankization, by, essentially by German osmosis. Polish military culture is deeply impacted by German military culture. Um, this is evident even in the uh, Polish vocabulary about military stuff. And uh, it began at that point, like including lots of Polish nobles, for example, even becoming uh, German subjects, uh, German vassals, actually, of, of of, for example, the Teutonic Order that in turn was a Polish vassal itself, right? So there is a lot of blending. Um, this is something that that you can find easily even in other lands in Bohemia there were even actual Czech nobility trans changing name into German one um, or Germanized one at least and therefore sticking to that model for saying how important the uh, the Western influence was at this point uh, and how much this especially entered in political and military culture um, the importance of having also this uh, of being exposed to this influence was was great for those who attempted to kind of centralize power so chiefly the monarchy but also the same nobility uh, for the sake of creating something more stable like it was seen in in the west like in terms of feudal structures that are by the centralized and today we look at it modern perspective saying ah, they didn't work actually at the time they worked like hell and they they were actually the model that every sensible uh, ruler would, would like to imitate also because they basically stressed the uh, the hierarchical order 
Slavic, the Slavic peoples, uh, up to the, the, in fact, the 11th century, the 12th century, had remained largely kind of less socially stratified than, than Western uh, Europe. They, um, they were freer. They were, they were kind of still in kind of a tribal uh, kind of structure, political and social structure, that was reflected in the military, in fact, by these... Um, relatively unstratified, uh, unsegmented cavalry that, of course, had its elite, had its heavy, early armored troops, um, but also was surrounded by large and consistent numbers of freemen that had their, their own impact, their own power. Um, the Poles maintained, uh, even in their military organization, for quite a long time the importance of, uh, of, of infantry as such, Right, Poland in this sense is very fascinating because it's not stereotypically like just other. Um, this, this actually, uh, in, before the 13th century, the Mongol invasion. This, this is proper of many, uh, many, many Slavic countries. I mean, the fact that they they still have good cavalry and good infantry, and also in consistent numbers. The Pospolita Ruzhenia, for example, in Poland was called, uh, by this time in the 13th century, actually always more rarely, because, let's say, the, the Frankish model that was, was, was having F effect in the same Poland, right? So that society was, even in there, progressively stratifying. And this is kind of ir ironically, and sadly for the cohesion of the monarchy, that the, the same kingdom of Poland had fragmented into several duchies, and, and that, at that point, where the nobility preferred to, and had the means and, and power and to, to invest in their own, um, you know, to, to create a territorial domination locally and not just joining the, you know, the big king in warfare, in raids that were, you know, in the previous centuries by certain standards, even on a larger scale, right? Because there, there, was, there were less impediments, let's say, uh, locally speaking. In, in the 13th century, instead, the situation has gotten kind of much more territorial, right? There is a much sounder territorial dimension and development of certain models that bring to the, the loss of freedom by the, um, and the freemen, as a matter of fact. And, and before I mentioned the, the Mongol invasions of Poland that um, were, as you know, like one of the gr greatest um, you know, events in European history at the time, the Mongol invasions basically stopped uh, at, the, at the gates of Germany, of Italy. They invested lots of countries, especially disintegrating, um, as it was known, the, the, the Kievan Rus and its political and social structures, and especially in Russia, in fact, reshaping completely the world political and military culture. I made several videos about medieval Russians stressing that how basically they had become Mongol vassals and their armies um, having become substantially an imitation of the one of the great uh, Mongol lords were, you know, this um, sound um, Slavic um, urban um, trade centers of, of the great Russian uh, rivers area had been raised to the ground and this boosted enormously the development of a actually a seigneurial culture, right? And the Driza uh, an incre incredible, um, um, uh, sim I didn't even want to say that, elitarization, I don't know, of, of uh, political and social culture on the model of, of the Mongols. So that basically by the, the late Middle Ages, you, you can't say that there was a difference anymore between Mongol armies and, and Russian ones. They were literally the same identical thing. Maybe the Russians retaining in the forests in the north, far, far from the steppes, more of this kind of... Uh, villages and towns, um, militias, and um, having this, you know, kind of more infantry in this regard, but for the rest being in material culture, kind of Mongolicized. In in in, po in Poland, we do not find this, of course, because first of all, um, the Mongols, yeah, they, they passed, they arrived. There is a progressive, actually, the first invasion in the twenty in the in the beginning of fourteenth century, uh, the thirteenth century was like kind of. Disastrous, um, seemingly from Polish archaeology, you can't see this. Uh, you can't see even buildings and before even fortifications built in, in wood and dirt. The uh, guards uh, were basically raised to the ground and rebuilt on much sounder, kind of more stone-based 
structures. Um, and so I think the impact of Mongol invasions on, on Poland is somewhat underestimated in general, right? Simply because, you know, the, the Mongols eventually settled more more far away, but still having this capability, uh, at least in some occasions, to reach still Poland. There was a steady decline, as you imagine, the third uh, Mongol invasion was actually, you know, not even successful. We can see in parallel, in that sense, the, the weakening of the same um, Tartar power because of sedentarization, that is, you know, the, the lack of that cohesion that the n nomadic um, political military cohesion that the nomadic lifestyle had kind of imposed to, to the first um, armies. So, a lot of changes, but for saying that actually Poland, however, maintained, uh, you know, a markedly and kind of typical Western Slavic uh, outlook in, in political and military culture. And, of course, even in Poland, during the 13th century, there was an increase of in, uh, let's say, senior, uh, seniorialization, we can uh, speak it in these terms, and social certification. So, of course, actually, the, the Schlachta um, increased uh, its power, um, and it would be interesting to, to see the history of those countries, especially of, R of Russia, telling the truth, um, if you know, the, the Mongol invasions had not occurred because it would have been a completely different political and social situation from that point. There were certain tendencies, of course, towards social certification, as we observed for Poland, precisely. But let's say that uh, history could have gone kind of otherwise with different political balances. The the chronical, for example, um, you know, monarchical weakness in uh, compared towards the, the the local nobility was a problem that eventually lasted into you know you can't attribute it just to the Mongol invasions of course something that would actually cripple on a very very long run a very progressive at a point even imperceptibly um, you know the the Polish and eventually Polish Lithuanian um, uh, power let's say but um, uh, it's obvious that these countries had a difficulty in fact centralizing power uh, and this of course was normal given also the, 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 the environment in itself this great uh, very large actually lands covered sometimes in forests and, and having few urban centers um, with kind of more difficult connections and uh, there were also substantially less fertile even centers like Krakow actually was the most important center it's you know, it merged because, you know, it, it occupied a more fertile area, right? So these are important, all important factors that have to be taken into consideration, but observing also the fact that, in fact, there are differences in uh, at a local level and that these were somewhat meaningful also uh, in, military, in military terms. For example, uh, in this period we can spot even... Uh, Central Asian influence, right, coming uh, from lands like Kievan Russia or Hungary, right, that is reflected in part uh, in uh, horse arnors, for example, some weapons, for example, um, the you know Hungary is basically the western ends of the steppes. Russia is naturally exposed to it, um, at least how Russia was at the time, in a sense, occupying up to, to, to the Black Sea, that encompassed the Saps as well. These were cultures that gave an enormous power, um, you know, an enormous importance uh, towards, in fact, the, the lord, the real, you know, the, the ultra-elite um, war ruler of the steppes that had all certain, even military symbolism attached, maces, right, uh, even, even certain... Uh, types of, uh, of equipment in this regard appear more prominently, for example, at the borders of Poland with these countries, because objectively, it, it's were in that place during the 13th century, th there was more social certification, more uh, inspiration from the steps, and, and you know that the mace in the step is kind of the, uh, one of the weapons of honor, because it, it entails the uh, it's the, the the weapon of the, the the most heavily armored warrior that fights with with a weapon that can be used only coming a close contact with an enemy who is also uh, 
this, uh, which is also designed as a weapon to crush an, uh, against enemy armor. So uh, you can't say regarding this sense, for example, by approximation, that in Poland there weren't war maces, right? Um, nor that there weren't in Germany, for example. But overall, it seems for certain finds on average that we have less. Why? But because probably Poland into this northwestern uh, Slavic area had maintained, had kind of a, remained, especially towards the northwest uh, of itself, uh, a more strongly uh, and originally Slavic character than uh, that instead all these waves waves of steps peoples from from had um had somewhat diluted and um and trans or and or transformed uh elsewhere right so um these are important changes because as we were saying also in that other video about um the sixteenth century polish military organization we made last week um we have um a Mm, the evidence that th this weren't changes for like forever that remain in that way forever during the 16th century there's an active um, attempt from Polish warfare to kind of grow more eastern in character because they had to cope with more eastern threats and therefore adapting um, towards uh, in, in that regard so there are swings right there are progressive adjustments that also naturally depend on the broader international scenario. I mean, meaning even think about the union with Lithuania. At this point wasn't quite of a, you know, it didn't have necessarily to happen. It could go otherwise. Lithuania renownedly could, even after the the, the end of the 14th century, where theoretically they, they were together um, uh, informally, they 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 just still winked uh, at the Russians, and there was even a you know a moment in which objectively Lithuania could be tied to, 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 to Russia, not with to Poland, right? So, um, and at the same time, in, in Poland itself, receiving this kind of strong Western vibes that, of course, were shaping, and at that point, in my opinion, in more closely, but it's debatable, uh, the, the same Polish warfare. So, one change over time uh, of this progressive say feudalization of Poland and social certification is naturally that the fighting element becomes increasingly uh, an elite and um, and therefore it, get, it becomes heavier. So the evidence we have is naturally that, I don't know, if you were to take the stereotypical uh, 11th to 12th century Polish infantrymen, uh, they would look in a kind of a particular uh, type, for example. There were the so-called Tarczownice, which uh, would be the shield carriers, right? This was a type of infantry that is quite, uh, I think, peculiar to Poland specifically. I mean, not that other Slavic counters didn't have such similar units, um, but it's somehow fascinating. We were just having a conversation with, with a with a follower the other day because um, you know that the area of Lithuania that is also documented by the same Polish in during the 13th century yes um, develops this kind of Pais type of, of shield but th there are seemingly other types of shields that here even had particular designs that were kind of more rectangular and larger as far as you know Polish archaeologists have just find parts of them and kind of guessing that could be up to 120 centimeters uh, tall, like it's four feet, basically, which can't fit in, in the class of pavises in the sense, not by composition, like this, you know, ultra layers of of wood that also have, the, you know, this pavise usually has the central rim, but actually we don't have much evidence of 13th century pavises and how they were actually done. Even in other regions were uh, where they were developed, um, and in my, my take on this is, you know, why Poland, why why Lithuania? Well, my idea is exactly, it's just an hypothesis, but it's exactly this fact that these were lands that were kind of, you know, being pressed from 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 the southeast substantially from these waves of um, horse archer nomads, so the presence of a tough kind of stubborn, uh, even fanatic. Uh, infantry that w w what it, it is what the especially the early medieval and also partly high medieval Slavs were actually seen of like this 
terrific defenders, like that could be very, very put up a very, very tough resistance. Had somewhat developed, um, maybe these forms of shields that were kind of more um, effective for effectively uh, making a wall of against um, arrow fire and even spears were, weren't that short objectively that they, they were up to eight foot long um, and the altogether if you consider like a uh, you know a shield wall equipped like that it is a pretty effective um, thing to to stop and and this reveals as we were saying before uh, f for stopping cavalry for example uh, which is interesting because in a fully kind of feudalized country you rarely find uh, infantry uh, of that type. Instead, in fact, this at least Polish warfare was still characterized for, for kind of a long time up to this point. The 13th century is an important turning point in these areas, and not only. Um, by solid presence of infantry was kind of characterized in this way. And um, body armor, though, was kind of rare. Like, Poland was... Um, like aside certain areas, maybe especially in the west, eventually were even lost. Um, they, they didn't have much of a great armor, local armor production. At least I think it's debatable in part. I mean, we we don't exactly know, but you know, generally speaking, these were poorer areas compared. I don't know if you go just a little bit westwards. Um, so this means less metals, less per capita wealth, um, and therefore you would see less. Uh, metal armor around than the average. I'm talking just simply on average, right? In Poland, of course, you could have the ultra-heavy uh, armored elite with the finest equipment, not necessarily uh, stereotypically imported from the West, like however it was the case, because the Poles made enormous use of stuff they, they were, especially from coming from Germany, uh, being bought and being, you know, even just, you know, there were Germans actually settling there and uh, selling this stuff, producing this stuff. Um, and um, the, the Slavs also had, of course, their heavily armored tradition, like everybody in Europe at this point had, of course, and why sh should have, have they not had it? Um, but let's say that on average, on average, they they wore kind of less armor. And uh, the, the the typical body armor could consist in things like, that was also a consistent thing, actually, in on leather kilted linen jerkins, uh, often reinforced with small iron plates or strips studded of studded leather, and often also fur trimmed. And do not underestimate this stuff. Like even very thick gambeson actually is pretty damn uh, effective against uh, against mm, blades uh, projectiles, depending on many things. For example, how sharpened and in which type it is sharpened a, a blade. Um, of course, the angle from which the, the hit arrives, and but you know, people tend to dramatically underestimate the power of um, of gams and, and tissue and, and thick tissues that were used, in fact, prominently. Um, the leather was used prominently, like the, there is not not a huge convenience. Like leather armor existed, but it was never prevalent, as far as we understand. Um, it was probably minority. Uh, by by far, actually, uh, like one tenth, it's plausible, and mostly leather. Well, of course, it's still some kind of organic protection, but mostly was used for actually fixating, fixing the the the, the metal parts on it. Like you can see, in even you know, how do you think lamellar armors were put together? Well, there was normally a an organic uh, um, skeleton, let's say, underneath, and then these things were sewn in, in, into there. And uh, and therefore that was the deal, kind of reinforcing this armor with, with iron plates, etc. Of course, there were full hauberks. Like, of course, these peoples used hauberks since since ever. Like, we can't think the, since even the, the the ancient world that they, they had it. For why should have they not had it? But of course, they were pretty ex expensive stuff. And um, there, there were also certain designs that um, were maybe kind of um, kind of older side even for example in helmets the, even up to the 13th century we can imagine the, the old nasal um, kind of helm you know reinforcement with the, the kind of the I don't know how to say that the, the conic shaped helmets stuff like that uh, that were not necessarily as effective but as you know in the 13th century especially when we talk about heavy troops uh, the, the, in the west the, 
the, the knights especially were, were enclosing now the face uh, usually and abandoning the the, the cup uh, as it was worn b before uh, in part or not it depends which kind of knights actually the lighter ones had also this chapelle de fer normally were you know left the face open but let's say that the, the stereotype the cliches is that in this let's say Slavic area uh, the, the more you went east, uh, the more you could find outdated stuff because it's normal, right? This, this existed in all times in history where there were kind of more productive areas that were a bit on the lead in terms of armor, um, technological production, and other countries kind of were normally poorer. They also tended to treasure certain armor and therefore making it, uh, having it around more. But of course, there was also local production, local imitation. In fact, I'm not a huge fan of those. Uh, you know, every time we see, I don't know, for example, even crossbow uh, warfare, we will see it later. Um, it's stereotypically saying, ah, this stuff came from Germany. Like everything that, w that looked kind of Westerner is because, you know, some German brought it. Of course, it was full of Germans in, in some places, in some areas that were colonized um, and uh, brought this kind of um, craftsmen as well, merchants, uh, etc., and knights, right? Let's not ever forget it, that these uh, Western Slavic powers, like uh, this is typical in Bohemia, but, but even in Hungary, for example, and in Poland, uh, like they, they hosted a lot of mercenaries from the West. Literally all the, the, the Western countries that were hired as mercenaries as... As outsiders, because in this sense they could back the monarchy in which they depended, by the, they were called from from the local nobility. Then instead, always trying to weaken, of course, the attempts of monarchical centralization, and um, and making it eventually a class of local Polish nobility because they were given land and settled down, eventually becoming uh, um, and having this way of let's say uh, social. A recyclation. I don't know how to say this, but you know the fact that, of course, that there were more peoples that had to be, you know, m more waves of these troops that had to be hired and settled. Because once they settled down, they were basically lost. The Hungarians, for example, um, used the Kumans, all these refugees that had come from the steppes when the Mongols came in, came in, and these guys set obtained from the Hungarian king the, the you know, the possibility of settling. And this actually happened even in Poland. Uh, in Lithuania also a lot, um, because these guys were, you know, they didn't have any other tie but with the sovereign that had allowed them to settle in that land. Of course, the, the locals weren't very happy about it, but, on the, you know, it, it was not even such a dramatic thing after all. And this bringing, of course, foreign influence in local warfare, right? So in Poland, by the 13th century, we can make this kind of brutal approximation by saying, you know, we can't Tip, kind of make this typus of um, of heavy infantrymen, right? Uh, having kind of now consistently heavier armor, right? Um, uh, but we didn't also address the the concept of infantry versus cavalry because if you see like even in iconographical sources, a guy that is covered from from head to to toe with um, with uh, with armor, like with with metal armor. Uh, well, it's, it's most likely you you can't tell whether he's an infantryman or a cavalryman, right? Or better, you can say whether it's a cavalryman or, or, or an infantryman in the sense that they are the same. They're the same thing, right? They're exactly the same thing sometimes, right? And especially in these countries, like where where in fact feudalism was still weaker than in the West probably you can see something that in fact had happened before in the West. Like if you take the typical, I don't know, 11th century Norman knight. Uh, we know these guys normally kind of dismounted, even if they were primarily cavalrymen, they dismounted m way more often than what a, I don't know, a Fr northern French, the same northern French um, cavalryman, uh, let's say better knight at this point, would do in the 13th, because kind of the, uh, the ultra-heavy Cavalrymen uh, would be um, would be most preferably always kind of preferably mounted. Even of course, if knights always dismounted, historically speaking, they always fought in every possible imaginable way, right? But I w my take on this is, I would suggest in in Poland at this time it wasn't quite that um, you know strict 
the social, political and social differentiation you could find in France, for example, where you know that the heavily armored guys, most likely, uh, you know, uh, just a, a man of the nobility, uh, of the highest nobility of feudality, of course, even in Poland is part of the elite, but it can still be, for example, the, the elite of a town. Um, uh, the Polish armies were actually, as we were saying before, m still based uh, in, in, uh, in at least in terms of numbers on this uh, local levies uh, where the same actually night military retinues were were, were present like the, the early you know the, the richest mm, townsmen obviously could could afford such uh, heavily armored equipment and fight essentially as knights and increasingly maybe uh, becoming more like the knights of the Maybe of the higher status of the origin of the maybe of the Piast uh, entourage, right, um, and eventually blending all together in the Schlacht. But um, just for saying that you you can't be so you know strict, and these guys knew how to fight um, in, in every kind of situation as well. And my 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 idea is also that um, in part. Uh, you know, what feudalism brings on the table is fundamentally a higher collective training of cavalry, w which is what kicks ass uh, all the way uh, by any standard, because it's really collective training that makes the difference. But in this, we can't say it, um, you know, in this picturesque way, this wilder areas of Europe, they're still wilder. Um, the Maybe this great collective organization that was, you see, even, even, even the Polish kingdom was still fragmented, etc. But this meant that still the individual fighter, uh, in order to ca compensate for this larger amount of collective training and uh, discipline coming from, from a you know, more concrete power from the bow, etc., would compensate with individual skill, right? And these guys were still able to, you know, even Poland is not uh, uh, an easy ground, like it's still very wild and forested in some areas, or marsh, it's, it's t tough ground, right? So these guys are probably even still more in contact with that hardcore, I can't say, nature or natural dimension that maybe the, the French nobleman living in his castle and just being summoned in this, in this much more highly uh, hierarchically organized type of warfare would have abandoned, right? So this, this is important to me and this obviously presents more chances for fighting um, both on horseback and on the ground, right? And, and still having to cope with very, very different enemies. You can't find everybody here. Uh, you can still fight wild wild tribes in the like uh, in, in the north uh, the, in the east. You can find the Mongols. Damn, <laughs> that's not someone you would like to find find you in front of you. You you find German knights fighting against you. Find I don't know this, uh, the, the the neighbors, the Bohemians, the Hungarians, the the the, the Russians, etc. So. Um, many different enemies that not all countries in Europe actually have with this great frequency, of course, even in here. Uh, but that that's something that leaves a mark in a military culture and ma makes it kind of more flexible. And actually, the more I read about Polish warfare, and the more I realize how uh, composed it was, and 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 probably functional in this sense, in the sense that the, the, these um, uh, even permanences or certain types of, of of you know military styles of uh, tactical um, specializations were um, said in, in the broad meant in the broad sense uh, were the the proof of a great adaptability and uh, of effectiveness even as a, as a warfare after all and you know there are other considerations of course um, at this time Poland is you know strengthening the and at, at its core, like it would evolve into the 14th century in something kind of more, you know, more structured, and uh, even the monarchy would kind of, mm, kind of agglutinate a bit better, etc. Um, and and the product are these types of wars that seem to have, as an elite, kind of heavier equipment than it was before, because these were guys now framed into a, uh, you know, a system of. of wealth distribution in which of course fewer people had more wealth and therefore could equip with better uh, uh, with better stuff 
So, uh, for example, uh, there is seemingly this very this is seemingly a very peculiar type of armor that uh, I that to Poland that I I have actually no direct evidence of because I'm reading stuff from a study that uh, seemingly have you know I don't know whether th there are traces I don't know whether maybe part of entire armors that can actually verify that these were entire like equivalent of the whole berk from you know covering all the torso the the shoulders and the part of the of the thighs for example or whether they were just kind of smaller parts but seemingly there were uh, old uh, leather jerkings and quaff that is even the uh, the quaff in fact the I don't know say in English but the one that covers your your head uh, male like the um, with iron rings soon all over them right so it's as if you had had a an old berk right but not with the older rings uh, chained but like with tied to these base of leather as if it was like just imagine in fact a, a lamellar armor but just with with, with lamella actually with rings on them and this seemingly is taken as a typically polish thing. i can't assure you because i don't have the direct evidence of this i even searched for it but you know here it's it's sad so it's, it's, this text is fairly reliable and um and i think it's very fascinating which doesn't mean this was what you would uh, kind of stereotypically see in poland but it, it was still there and it's kind of a different form of armor that f for some reason was existed at the time and was fine just just in there for now and of course it would be normal holbergs right um and uh, if you take so many different you know the the, the ultra elite um noble polish noble uh knight would be an identical copy of a german knight at this point like there is no absolutely no difference of any kind right and for example there are manuscript illustrations from the 14th century depicting prince henry ii the peers of silesia killing killed at the Battle of Linnitz in the third, 1241 against the Mongols, right? And Silesia being, at this point, basically being absorbed by the Germans, it's literally identical to a German knight. Take the the seal of uh, Othokar, uh the second of Bohemia, for example, that depicts the very same thing. It's identical. You have a German sword, etc. The only difference, apparently, being famous among Western uh, Slavs, being these crests with uh, eagles um, uh, feathers that you know Poland uh, Poland symbol being famously the, the, the eagle um, that stand back this is stuff that the actually kind of old in the Indo-Europeans people had but the Slavs kind of maintained more prominently you know the the, the origin of the of the Polish of the Polish uh, eagle is obviously pagan but it was still framed into uh, in this moment in which this People were, in fact, getting acquainted with new Frankish models and um, maintained that there is this extraordinary continuity of kind of ethnic traditions and of kind of Western modernization, we can call it anachronistically in this sense, that is pretty impressive. And actually, Slavic. Slavic panoplies are freaking amazing to look at. And I, I'm, I'm looking forward to expand Schwerpunkt a lot a lot on slavic warfare in other areas we never talked about i don't know even uh okay let, let's keep it by now but just for saying that of course there are lots uh at this point like uh poland is on the way of non-return like in terms of westernization they're fully uh at this point they're fully within you know they got christianized in 966 traditionally uh, they're fully within the, the Western orbit. The Roman Catholic influence, this um, heavy German influence, and as we're noticing also in the, the, the last video about starting from the late 15th century, uh, Poland, they, you know, there, there wasn't at that point nothing that you, you could say, you're, like, this is actually typically Polish at the point, uh, at the point you can't distinguish them, right? And this is important because um, overall, if you look at the spread of that Frankish model we were talking about before, uh, you can already say that, especially by the 14th century, like 
the, all the, the various ethnic differences in terms of panoply are, are over. Like if you take a, uh, a knight from, I don't know, from Portugal, one from Poland, one from, I don't know, uh, Norway, one from Sicily, they're basically the same, I, literally identical thing, there is no difference whatsoever. Like you can find, of course, differences in warfare in certain other idea, but the outlook is basically basically the same. By the 13th century, uh, especially in these more e eastern direction, you, you d still find the continuities with other elements that for some reason were ha had remained, had the city had that hadn't still homogenized uh, overall. Um, and in terms of these uh, equipment, of course it would be even um, probably guys who fought with this heavy armor that they didn't actually fight on horseback like um, f uh, I presume that everybody who had the who had the, the, the money for uh, affording this kind of equipment uh, if didn't necessarily have a horse or you know practice there regularly however I mean surely they had horses actually d d their monetary equivalent but they surely knew even how to handle one Right. So, but of course we can't exclude the fact that we're, you know, guys going to fight on foot by the foe in certain situations equipped in this way. Because heavy infantry after all was there and an infantry is, uh, you can't switch b between infantry and cavalry in certain concepts, but you also want to fight sometimes on foot. Right. And especially in this land, and on this ground, you, you, you would, that there wouldn't you wouldn't miss the, the chance of doing it for convenience. Uh, so um, you could find out naturally even different combination uh, in the sense that first of all the, the, the major probably the majority of this elite infantry elite we can say kept using by the 13th century mm, the type of mm, of uh, armor that we described before for the, for the 11th and the 12th so actually with not much of uh, complete metal armor um, but with some just re reinforcements and rest being organic material right um, these guys could be simply you know members of wealthy noblemen's retinues or the relatively well equipped town militiamen right so that and sometimes were actually maybe the same thing um, even the uh, touch of Nizia arms uh, probably by this time hadn't quite changed substantially um, except you can find more often swords mm, replacing uh, kind of more traditional weaponry such as axes right uh, as a secondary weapon usually and uh, this is also important because uh, of course the swords are uh, more expensive, so of course Poland is is developing at this point. They have a you know they are always more interconnected with the rest of Europe. They they have uh, urban societies growing substantially, trade etc. So even finding a sword and having the the money to to buy them doesn't become that difficult anymore. Especially by the f by the 14th century in Europe, you know having a sword wasn't a big deal. Like even the the average paid soldier could, could afford one like of course not swords are are the same um, but this speaks naturally even for that kind of progressive transformation transition from kind of a kind of warrior type of uh, military culture to a kind of a more gentrified one um, for which the axe is something you can use in kind of more different situations this, this word is more you know directed at that specific fighting use and you would use it just for, 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 for that uh, um, shields were evolving um, in also towards a more Western European design um, the some characteristics characteristic ones in Poland having been in previous centuries a large oval type that still existed at this point toward the 13th century 
um, and other forms like even circular ones with boss and cursive form of reinforcement uh, appear in this area uh, era sorry but chiefly in the hands of um, the peasantry uh, so not much of um, uh, particularly you know this was for lighter lighter infantry of course also because the round shield is, was normally also smaller and uh, etc but also the the touch of Nietzsche would would have sometimes this kind of equipment um, so these are vague terms actually they I don't think the term touch of Nietzsche is indicative of a particular kind of social class that they, they were mostly a kind of tactical mm, specialization of even the, you know when, when I talk about specialization doesn't ne necessarily imply professionalism or uh, an actual like that it could do just that but you know that they were maybe used on the battlefield in, in a particular way you know, maybe grouped or you know particular position within the ranks for tactical purposes but maybe not corresponding to uh, a class or a group of people who are politically and socially defined, right? Um, what is interesting also is that by uh, the 13th century, some heavy infantry in Poland had also adopted the crossbow, right? Um, the crossbow uh, was part, let's say, of that Frankish package that had started developing just some day ago made a video on actually the, the origins of the uh, crossbow revival in in western Francia during the 10th and the 11th century so the crossbow spreads as much as the, the Frankish military model and political culture and social form um, and uh, and therefore arrives in Poland kind of later um, as I don't know artillery would apparently come later towards the end of the 14th century so actually with always a, a closer gap actually with with the west but still minding that th there are these kind of differences but not much of for the technical problems it's not that they didn't know how to build one of course crossbows were there even like in poland like in even in the 10th century and and firearms were there even at the beginning of 14th someone made it someone broke them whatever the, the problem is when you you must have actually a, a, a structure um, base in order to, you, to afford them to, to use them in kind of proficient numbers and effectively like uh, substantial uh, that, so that it can make a substantial difference on the field right and that's the point um, in fact the, the Polish s had seemingly been used kept using bows and long bows telling the truth uh, longer than uh, than their their western neighbors um, yes, long bows, because have we explained many times, long bows have existed since prehistory literally everywhere, so th there is actually nothing about specifically about Britain or other areas, and of course th the Poles had had long bows as well. Um, and, and that tells you also about the kind of wilder taste in the sense that, you know, n knowing how to use a bow is much more complicated uh, and takes much uh, longer training than using a crossbow, right? And the reason why the Poles would use bows is that uh, even if they knew how to use them, and why? Because maybe they used it or leave it um, still a um, higher contact with nature than others. They hunted more. They, they still were kind of uh, adaptable in this situation, and were also exposed to enemies that made a greater use of bows. Like southeast of Poland, that's the steppes, guys. It begins there. So um, even with, against the Hungarians, they still made that uh, from the south, and that uh, you know they had horse archery for for a long time, in hiring, as same Polish armies, Eastern like nomadic mercenaries as well. Never never forget about this. So uh, by osmosis, of course, the bow existed in Poland and preferably more towards southeastern Poland to him than elsewhere, where n the northwest was much more similar to Germany, right? And um, and the fact that crossbows were employed also by foot soldier and that were kind of more specialized, like uh, being the equivalent, the foot equivalent equivalent of knights, like the case we have we have been looking at today, is actually not strange. 
like the fact that, of course, normally crossbowmen were lighter troops. In fact, it seems that in Polish armies, uh, actually since the 12th century, you immediately start finding finding this mounted crossbowmen in kind of s substantial numbers, which is very, very interesting. Because before they would have used bows, so actually the Poles had uh, horse archers as well, uh, traditionally. Uh, ethnically, we can say, um, and um, and substituting them with bows, and I've always been surprised actually by the Polish flexibility, uh, Polish cavalry fa flexibility towards uh, arms. Like even if you look at the Usars in the early modern period, they, you know, while the Western knight would consider like firearms and crossbows already by his age, telling the truth, as kind of a cordly weapon and concealing it its use that actually existed anyhow uh, in official sources and whatever actually it seems in Poland for example the Usars made a very early use of uh, arquebuses on, on horseback and being good <laughs> with it and, and and being actually making them even more flexible and more capable which actually also speaks for the extremely high level professionalism of these guys like that that uh, still from like they were exceptional from a, a collective training point of view at that point but still retain this kind of individualistic ethos typical of the warrior um, and maintaining in fact this lot of uh, kind of traditions uh, ethnical traditions and say that that characterize a lot of Polish warfare throughout the up to the 18th century basically um, and uh, what I was saying, in fact, is that normally, um, even in Poland, of course, crossbowmen um, were normally light infantry or light cavalry. And also in here, there is the stereotype, basically crossbows were introduced largely by the Germans, German colonization, immigration in Poland, uh, which is true, actually because many market uh, centers, etc., were mm, substantially populated by Germans, etc., and have bringing these weapons from, from the West and having them already in place. But, of course, they were employed by everybody in Poland, and even the... I mean, even if you are, are a heavily armored guy who uses the lance, even a sword uh, as a side... Uh, lance as first weapon and the primary weapon... That maybe a sword as we've seen at this point, or an axe or whatever, uh, as a uh, side weapon, you know, you could still go around with a crossbow, right? Why not? We we know, actually, that even the the ultra-specialized, sp professional, heavily armored knight of the Frankish tradition always made use of every possible type of side weapon of any sort, including, including crossbows, right? Um, and... Uh, yeah, it could be employed, right? That, that's simply a matter even of customization. Like if you if you have enough money to buy uh, this um, iron armor, you have money also for buying a, even a small crossbow and bringing it with you, as long as it's, uh, as it's not a you know an impediment for too much weight, maybe or to for moving etc. And uh, using it in certain situations can save your life, maybe even make it make it to you lose at one point, but you know, uh, it's possible. So the fact that heavily armored troops are stereotypically just about shock melee and and not about missile uh, weapons is, you know, it's just an approximation. Of course they could use it, and they did. And they knew how to, especially, right? Because if there was, if there was someone there who knew how to use this stuff, well, this was the elite that knew how to use literally every single type of weapon existing in absolute terms ever, right? So it's that simple, and it actually works every time. As an and, 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 you, and the cool thing about this is that you don't need an actual evidence for it in order to know that that it exists. It's simply practical common sense, right? And yeah, and actually, well, I said before that. Um, Ah, wait, we, we have actually evidence of Polish knights proper um, in their retinues having large numbers of crossbows or in, in the 13th century, or at least having crossbows there, and, and they of course existed since the previous century or even before, right? So, yeah, 
I think th this is pretty much it, or maybe we can add something else, I don't know. I... I presume... that... no, I think we can stop here. After all, I don't have much else to add. Yeah, a lot of German armor manufacturing, especially in swords and kind of elite, um, kind of expansive weaponry. But really, and and this I interesting Mace's presence in um, kind of more eastern, southeastern, in the southeastern area that resembles a bit more the, the stereotypical steps knights um, mace uh, preference, let's say, than in the west, but it's also kind of not very, like, it, of course even in the west the mace was actually very, very like, among knights very very common, right? But that's only when you find an ultra elite. And what I'm s suggesting here is that Poland on average, on average, uh, had less ultra elite and more medium elements than much more more stratified societies like you could find for example especially after the mongol invasion into russia or or even in in hungary right and in poland also you know you know fitting into this picture but probably more uh, let's say less than others uh, than, than these other countries right and yeah, this is my take, my hypothesis on it. Then I don't know actually how. Wh what's the complete picture of actual evidence of maces and whether we can trace a pattern like of tendency of statistically? I don't think so, but I think it's an hypothesis and it still makes sense. And but it remains an hypothesis, right? All right. So I think for today we can stop here. Uh, what could we say add maybe well I don't know it's obvious that this heavily um, armed infantrymen would tend to fight in picked bodies or some sort I mean being you know the the the, um, the foot equivalent of the knights or being actually knights themselves on foot right and therefore having shock effect even in on foot charge and being made for melee in close combat and um, and having a, you know, a training that fitted the the requirements of, the, of this kind of fight, and but that's pretty much it. And of course, this um, even the increase of crossbows, of course, speaks for the spread of he more, let's say, for heavier armor, right? So it goes all together, and you can see the the consequences of this. O over time, consider that by the 13th century, when Poland, in fact, was was now getting he finally consistently heavier, the, like at the level of, uh, of the West, the, the West starts developing plate armor, and there is actually some interesting evidence that about the so-called Polish belt. It was probably a, it was a type of uh, armor. I, I made a. Uh, I made a video actually about it uh, that is titled, if I'm not wrong, it's from a couple, of, it's from more, more than one year ago. That the, the 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 spread of plate armor in the West, something like that, um, and we comment on things like the iconography, like the statue of Saint Maurice in the the Cathedral of Magdeburg, and and we notice that basically, in fact, plate armor or originates first than in other countries in Germany. And especially in Eastern Germany, that is exactly the border with Poland, in exactly the time of the Mongol invasion. So um, there is uh, some evidence uh, in in Poland of these so-called fact that's been called Polish belt, historiographically. That is basically um, uh, pro quite likely a um, or surely actually a um, uh, organic armor that basically bends all, covers all the the abdomen, right, that looks strikingly similar to what plate armor would become with metal. And, uh, and therefore, there's been this hypothesis that maybe with Mongol warfare, also the need of covering yourself more with, um, against arrow fire and also in, uh, at the sides, etc., would have spread among these peoples. Yeah, I mean, even before the Mongol invasions in, in these countries that were more exposed to steppes warfare, like Poland, Russia, etc., 
this type of armor that albeit of organic w was still conceived like in the same functional fo form of, of plate armor how it would spread uh, in the future so some have suggested that the polish belt might have been a model for the eventual plate armor the first plate armor that in fact was mostly about the torso initially um, eventually other plates eventually kind of coming took over all the night over the centuries and so this mm, we, we talked about that in that video and this can also explain better why there was this need for getting heavier right and creating new solutions to to our fire such as for example the one of the shield bearers right so not a strictly technological solution but a, a tactical solution which are two different things telling the truth and it's obvious that you know Germany had more iron had more kind of capabil possibilities um, they invent they, they developed mostly the plate armor maybe the, the Poles had found out more like tactical solutions including the one of dismounting by the way because um, actually going around even on horseback that is you know the horse you could have gambes and etc but not much of plate armor this not plate not armor this time very often uh, it was very rare at least so actually fighting on foot when you're uh, and, and as a heavily armored mm, infantry man, uh, uh, knight like and uh, protecting yourself with a large shield was a thing against horse archers i mean it neutralizes it pretty well so and and that's why i i suspect even with this tendency in the area between poland and lithuania the presence of this types of shields that are that seem dramatically close to what even you find for example in Italy developing at this same time Italy being the place where it was most crossbow fire in all of Europe at that point um, and and in Poland and Lithuania surprise surprise you know th these areas were invested by the Mongol invasions in the same century so maybe there is a link between the development of s kind of similar shapes and that eventually would evolve in the pavis that is more known but that already at this time probably had displayed and maybe in the Slavic lands, kind of earlier than than even this the Italy, for example, uh, having been more in contact with steps peoples since longer time. In fact, this kind of quadrangular, kind of large shields that are um, that are actually and flat, by the way, so that they're perfect and good for creating a shield wall, which concave shields actually can't do because they're most for individual soldiers, like like knights also for cavalry speak for in my opinion maybe some traditions that you can't find in that region since a lot of centuries before telling the truth and are widespread all over like uh, western eastern southern slavs uh, because probably they were exposed to a lot of more of horse archery than other peoples right so there is a thin uh, let's say um, a tiny and meager evidence about this but um, I think it makes sense, and if you consider the area and what its warfare was, in my opinion, uh, it's pretty, pretty positive, pretty good hypothesis after all. It also doesn't take really much to formulate it myself, um, as it's you know makes sense on, on a simpler base. And consider that military matters are usually more like they're generally simpler than they seem. Like you don't have to go dip into thinking like ah oh, who knows which how many uh, you know which strange things occurred into that local warfare that we don't know no we're well, actually military problems and especially at this time are pretty much the same everywhere and in fact this makes kind of similar solutions more frequent and also developing independently in different regions um, and without much of a surprise after all and it's funny how like uh, there are sometimes huge debates on this topic like when it takes to the ancient world medieval world and when you get to where warfare really gets very complicated very technological very structured like in the modern age in the contemporary age nobody discusses it and the reason being that like it's the latter one is much more complicated while actually ancient medieval warfare is you know fairly simple right to understand it like and I don't know I studied medieval history so maybe it's the reason but as you noticed on Schwerpunkt I didn't make much of a modern contemporary history video but I will get to that promise so 
Um, all right, and for now it's really over, and I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you are interested in my upcoming content. content. Um, and for now, just thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.